um, the company which I started about exactly 1990 after 20 years diving the beautiful part of the reef, I realized that the reef is being deteriorating even then. I decided to dive in blue water. And uh, since then, since 1988, um, that's when I started the company uh, to be in a company of the ocean giant. And we know the ocean is 70% of our planet or more and contain a lot of a lot of good things and some of them 50% of the air we're breathing. I started my expeditions or my uh, being in the water is on the back of the camel in the rising of the reef diving uh, all around the world in the in the 60s, in the early 70s. And that's when I start my photography underwater. What I'm going to share with you is actually a story uh, that took so many years to produce with an anthology of my photography of years of being um, pushing the envelope and living on the edge of comfort, uh, comfort, comments and common sense and the wilderness and wilderness. The only weapon I carry with me today is actually knowledge, experience, and the camera to express my vision, to express what I see there for, as I mentioned before, uh, mostly for the animal behavior. Because as a photographer, as you know, and everybody today with the iPhone, with the iPad, everything digital, everybody has a camera. There are more, more pictures of animals than animals in the wild. However, very limited images that took time and patience and knowledge to share with the wilderness and to understand the behavior. And the behavior is the one that, in my view, create the connection with the animal and then the desire and the effort to protect them. What I'm going to share with you next is about two and a half trailer for the movie that was made about my career and especially the encounter or the epics encounter with the polar bear. And we talk about it also. Amos to me is uh, one of the best ambassadors of the ocean. It takes huge amount of risk to bring those images which nobody else has ever been able to capture. He comes back with images that no one can get. He is probably the best underwater still photographer in the world. His story was always read in mystery. He doesn't have a normal life. He doesn't have children. He's married to the ocean. He has this passion. <laughs> he wants to be in the water, close to polar bear, swim with the biggest predator on Earth. If the wind is too turbulent, we're not going to go there. There's so many factors that can work against you. All right, guys, we're taking off. Uh... Almost on his team. Have only five days to find a polar bear and take the picture. It's the one animal where humans are part of their food chain. People get eaten by polar bears. He needs that adrenaline rush. He needs to be at the edge. And if he doesn't do it in one way, he'll do it in another way. And maybe his military background has hard to do with it. What happened to Amos in the army is a mystery to me. He didn't come home, really. I can see blue sky compared to see flames. I wonder if there is some kind of unfinished business just for us. Living in yourself, and you go all the way with no matter what else. And this is all the power of being. <laughs> Almost wants to prove that those large animals aren't our enemies, and that we can live with them in harmony. No, no. So I watched that um, on your website, 
earlier in the week and mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, is the movie out now and if so where can people see it yeah the movie is out we can only rent it so far the okay producer, the producer have not released it yet or is not they get out into uh, publicity yeah so you can go on a um, picture of his life one word dot com uh -huh. and you can rent it for 10 bucks uh, for three days or 20 bucks and you can own the movie okay thank you very much i'm you looking forward to it 19 i just thought it was fantastic you, you, you yeah really it look, looks like it's really okay. good thank you guys so let's go back to 1982 40 years ago i was diving one of the first time with the great white we were i was on a mission or actually it was a trip that I set up, National Geographic called me and wanted to send also the late Dr. Eugenie Clark and David Dubile Thank to get some pictures uh, or to do or to, to catch a shark to do an autopsy and so on and so forth. And I set it up together, together with Rodney Fox, the famous Rodney Fox, the guy that was beaten by in 1967 and it took 470 maybe stitches to put him together. But he survived until today he ran probably the best great white operation, but all was in the cage. In this case, we had we had hard time getting the shark into the cage. We put a lot of bait around, around the boat, and eventually after seven days, the shark arrived, and then start all the drama and how to make the shark behave or act in a way that 40 years ago we don't we did not know what happened today. And there is a, a very interesting situation happening those days. So the shark came in, but it did not do because the bait was underwater on the side of the boat. So we decided to put a tuna fish on a pulley of this pond trawler that we use. Uh, there was not really a liveaboard at the time, it was a pond trawler that was converted to take us. So they had pulleys on the side. We put the bait, the, the fish in the water, and we wait for the shark to show up. The shark come in, and like all predator, all predator will be a jaguar, will be a lion, will be a cheetah, will be any predator on land or underwater. Never take a prey that it is look unusual for them or not native to them, the position, the movement, do not attack it before they will inspect it and to make sure that they can do whatever they want. In other words, they spend, they spend predators spend a lot of energy to catch the prey. They need to make sure that they survive it, that they succeed it. So the shark, the same thing. The shark came in two or three times around the bait before it decided to take it. But as it decided to take it, by sign that I gave Rodney, or Rodney knew as well, he started to pull up the bait out of the water and the shark leap out and open mouth, as big as you see it in the picture. Pay attention, just, just under the eye, the broken teeth on the top uh, part of the jaw. Remember that in the next few pictures. So what happened in 1985, a friend of mine, somebody probably know him very well, uh, Dr. Ryan at the stock agency in Hawaii, and he got already involved in digital and he decided to change the picture and remove the bait. The picture become very well um, how they call it, got a lot of attention and bought by many magazines for their, for their drama, whatever they want to do with the shark. But not until discovery, the famous discovery, and that's the reason I started this, this meeting today with the shark, because discovery just finished their shark week. So 19, 1993, 15, how many, almost 11 years later, they decide to, to take the picture and look at this shark. If you take the picture horizontal, you'll see the same broken teeth on the top uh, on the top jaws. So they took my picture that was horizontal, move it vertical, and create the poster to attract everybody else in. At the time, I realized I having a problem, or I had a problem as a photographer or as a naturalist or a whatever, uh, cons conservation. So I decide I'm going to do something different. I'm going to try 
diving in open water with a great white and to show to the world, to show to the world in very specific way the shark will not attack me or anyone else that travel with me underwater. Now, why um, Discovery used the vertical picture? Because it created a subliminal line to what happened in 74 and during the movie, jo for the movie Jaws. At the time, they did not have a picture to, to, to illustrate it. So they had to put illustration, again, a vertical image of the shark coming out over the surface. At the process, again, like everybody else at the time, I put the camera, actually, I put the bait in front of the boat. And as the shark came in, the bait was taken and I put my hand in the water, take the picture of the shark. I was lucky, I got my hand off. And I got a cover of magazine, of course. Let's look for the story really about happening. We are talking now 1993, 1994, with one of the best shark wrangler, Andre Hartmann. And unfortunately, the young man that was a nature boy passed away just two years ago. But he was remarkable. And a lot of what I learned was from him. And again, of course, from David Dubillet and, and uh, Eugenie Clark. Here we are in a um, uh, dangerous reef in Australia, uh, in the dangerous reef. In the South Africa, in the, um, oh, the seal island, and in May, June, July, the number of seal from ten thousand to rise to almost thirty thousand because of the young babies, and they go to the water because they don't know better than this that this is their open sea, their open pool, and the shark come in and feed on them, and the shark chase after them, and then the seal try to run away, and into the kelp hopefully find rescue for or safety from the shark. But the shark knows better and the shark has a different behavior that we had a chance really to stop for a moment and talking about the shark behavior because the shark able to breach out of the water and catch the seals. But those behavior happen only at the early morning hours of the day and the late hours of the evening and why? because the angle of the sun over the horizon, the lower the angle, the limited amount of water enter the water. So as the sun rises in the morning, six, seven, eight o'clock, the more and more light, then the seal can see the shark underwater. But if there is less light, the seal cannot see the shark, but the shark can see the silhouette of the seal. When most people go, uh, go surfing, early morning, late afternoon, 95% of shark attack, Australia, California, South, America, South Africa, happen during those time in early morning, late afternoon. As the sun starts to go down in the evening, five, six, seven o'clock, then people come back from work, out of school, they go surfing and the shark go hunting. If you are in an area where there are seals and you go out, activity in the water at those hours, likely that something going to happen. Then I went to Mexico and to do the same thing. But in Mexico, the advantage was there is clear water. Clearer anyway compared to South Africa. In South Africa, visibility will be between 10 to 30 feet. In Mexico, the visibility is 30, 60 to 80 feet. And we talk about it for a moment. One of the things that I discover, or I find out, and there is the picture, that seal and shark live together. And the seal actually chasing the shark, harassing the shark. And there is a very a very good um, a PhD student, or by now is, is a lecturer, um, his name, um, I forgot his name, that, he was hosting us and was ed educating us when we get there. And he came with the idea or with the summary, the shark feed only once every three to four weeks. They don't feed every time they see the seals or the seals in front of them, like you see in this picture. So I decided to do something that was at the time extraordinary and diving outside of the cage with no protection and no bait. Now, Great White coming to Mexico or to Guadalupe only 
starting in July and August, now is the beginning the prime time, but the prime of all time is October, November. And why? Because of the, uh, the, the seal, the, oh, my memory start betray me. <laughs> the, the, the seals, the, the elephant seals, the large one coming in October, November, and the great white coming in big number to feed on the elephant seals because the big one, because they are very rich in blubber. When, we, when I go to the water without bait, but only lower the cage, just the sound of the metal cage in the water, the tank bouncing against the, the metal of the cage creates sound. And the shark is, most of the shark will be very attracted, very interested and attracted to the sound, come to inspect it. But they are not aggravated. I don't tease them. And I went to the water and this picture taken of me, I'm in the picture here by Jeb Corliss, one of the world leading best jumper. And together we attempted to do that. And he took the picture here. And I was, since it, I already have done it before, so I was already prepared myself for the picture I want to take. And in the camera, in the housing, as you see here, I had with me a Nikon normal lens. And many of you photographers know a normal lens. It is actually a 50 millimeter lens. And why it's called normal, 50 or 60? Because it's normal because the, the angle of the view of the lens is the same thing as our view in our eyes without binocular, without any tool. Our normal view is the same thing as a 60 millimeter lens. I took the picture now, it's like less than three feet away between us, one meter. What you're going to see next is exactly what your eyes will see. Oh, I'm sorry, just moment, one more moment. And Jeb took a picture of me behind me and to where the shark. So what happened here? You see me, I'm much larger than the shark and I'm not. I'm only maybe six or seven feet all together with the fin. The shark is 15 feet long. But every lens, if it's not normal, have a distortion. No matter how wide angle, has a distortion. And if you use, use fish eyes, the most distortion. And that's what happened here. So here you go. And that's what happened with the normal lens. This is image is not cropped not motivated, not changed, nothing happened. It is as it is on the frame. This shark was smiling to the camera and I'm three feet away. The next second, the shark just keep going down, down diving. One of the big, one of the most important element of my diving and leading over 200 people during the time that was allowed, that I lead into diving in open water with the shark. The most important element was buoyancy control because the shark in Guadalupe, their behavior as such has come from Mauricio, the name of the researcher. The, his his observation, observation is that the shark will go down, dive deep to where the bait or with the bait, with the elephant seal and attack them at 80, 100, 120 feet deep. But if we stayed at 30 feet and not chase, not go after the shark, we, I prove that over 200 people, nobody ever got hurt. Nobody, and no, no time the shark made any aggression behavior toward us. I must say here something very interesting, that this season, no diving in Guadalupe with shark. The local government or CONAP, the Environmental Organization of Mexico, stop all shark diving, cage diving in Guadalupe. I don't know for sure why I did not have information. My assumption or part of the rumor that goes on is because the greater number of operator, number of people increasing dramatically and the demand on the operator to be aggressive toward the shark. So the shark will show their behavior, their aggression behavior, their power, open mouth, open jaws, and several shark got hit or because of their mo motion or because of the dynamic they have, they hit the cage and many shark got wounded and some of them even passed away. 
So there is no more shark diving for this year anyway, for this season in Guadalupe in Mexico. Sadly, there is similar situation for not because of shark diving, but because of orca hunting of shark in South Africa. In the area that was very prolific with shark in, of Hansbury in South Africa, in Muscle Bay, there is no shark, no great white to be seen. There was recorded over 13 to 15 great white body washed on the beaches and most of them missing only one thing. The, the bait or the attack was on the liver of the shark and um, this kind of behavior is attributed only to the orcas. And the shark keeps smiling, not only one, and it's two, and three, all of them different one. <laughs> and we did it again and again with no problem. And as you see here, another opportunity of the diver swimming together with the shark and reaching out. This picture is one of my classic that I like the most. It is the first time I went in 93 after the experience in, in February, um, in um, no, July, August, July of 93 in Feb, on uh, May 1994, I went with Andre Hartmann and got this picture swimming with the great white uh, in South Africa um, and open cage or open water. We move from one predator to the next. So before I'll go ahead, if anybody have question about the great white, let's concentrate one item at a time. Anybody there? I don't have any questions, but I just think that is absolutely amazingly beautiful, those photos and that opportunity. Thank you, Mackenzie. I have Anybody? a question almost. Yes. You said that the great whites were what, 16, 18 feet? Were they juveniles or full grown? A 16, 18, they're quite full grown. A juvenile will be between nine to 12 feet as you see them, or you could see them, or anybody that went years before in July, August, they will see the young one between nine, 11, and 12. When they come to 14, 15, they're already uh, mature. Wow. Thank so you. One, one question I had was, um, you know, people use bait because otherwise you're probably never going to see like a, a great white. Um, without bait, would you see them on most of your dives or did you have to get lucky to find one? Okay. When, when I did my trip again, I aim into the peak performance time. It's different when you run a boat, when you have a boat cost million dollars and you have to pay for the boat for the whole month, for the whole, yeah. uh, you have to run it June, July, July, August, September, October, November. Right. I choose only the right time. I chartered the boat for this particular time, two right. or three weeks, October, November, which is the peak present time of the shark. Right. In Guadalupe. Right. We use chum to attract the shark. Yes, we put mm, okay. blood, mix of blood and oil or fish uh, on the water to attract them to the boat. Yeah. Okay. But we did not put bait okay. to have the shark open and aggressive. So what happened, the shark will come to the, to the boat, to the, to the chum, and you have the cage in the water. But when the shark arrives, everybody wake up and run to the edge of, of the boat to look at them. And then they start to throw a piece of meat in the water attached to a cable, to a line. So the shark come in and try to attack it. The shark come one time and run around, and then the puller pull the bait out of the water. The shark goes away and they throw again the bait and the shark come back again. But usually on the third, the third or the fourth time, the shark will try to attack the, the, the bait. Mm -hmm. And then there is a, 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 a tug of war together between the shark and the, the handler. He mm -hmm. will try to pull it out of his mouth or wait in the last second before when he opens his mouth and take it away. And then the shark miss, but because of the energy will con and the, the energy and the dynamic of the shark motion, which is fast, it will go and hit itself against the cage by mistake, of course. Mm -hmm. He did not know that the, shark, the cage is there and then get the trouble. Okay. So 
the, my idea was remove the bait, have the charm attract the shark, or lower the cage is 30 feet, the shark, the cage move in the water in the current, already create noise because the aluminum cage is metal. It's, and three or four people with me in the cage, our tank banging against the cage, it create noise. The shark will come sooner or later, the shark will come in, you see, into the boat and into the cage. Again, okay. for photography purposes, if you go for the circus, the trip was only three days. All of the yeah. operators are running only three days trip. Pass, yeah. pass, pass. When I did the trip, my trip was seven days. Mm. Because you never know when the animal will show the good behavior or yeah. the behavior that allow you to be one-on-one -on -one and photograph them for one meter away. Yeah. So it so my mindset is different. I'm not an operator. I don't run a million dollar boat. <laughs> I run trips for right. the purpose for education and preservation, if I may. Yeah. On that shark that you had looking into your camera, do you think it was looking at its reflection? If you look at oh, most likely, yes. Yeah. yeah. You see the eye totally open. When the shark come in, usually when the shark come in to take a bait, they close their eyes, the membrane goes over the eyes so they will not hurt them. Um, and that's what happened most often. But when I dive with it and I took the picture, you can see the picture, I, I can show you back later, the eyes remain open at all times. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There was no threat. There is no aggression. Right. Okay, now, thank you. I have, I have my other scenario to all of that also. Shark never attack anything that is vertical in the water because there's nothing vertical in the water. Everything else will be elephant seals, will be a tuna, and even a, a seal that's swimming on the surface. They're all horizontal. So when I'm in the water or any diver with me in the water, vertical, making bubble with the tank, I'm, we're totally stranger to them. They're no interest in us. And that's a proof is 200 people. I've taken more than 200. Nobody ever <laughs> experienced any severe or any change of behavior by the shark. There were a few people that paid, paid dearly to be in a cage with me out of the in a, and stayed in a cage, did not want to go out. But after two or three days, they got out happily because they see there is no change. So the drama we run by our brain or whatever the media affected us throughout all these years. It is so powerful, but until you show people hand to hand in the field and it's totally erased and totally different view about life. Thank you. All right. We'll deal with another predator, a big one that we all been uh, taught and of course have a reputation that unfortunately, or fortunately is true, they feed and they and they attack people for different reason with the polar bear. But they need to sleep also. They need to rest. They need to make their energy. And this is, we are here on the floor edge in Canada, uh, out of um, Arctic Bay, but 120 mile all the way towards Somerset Inlet. And we are uh, in Buffin Island, between Buffin and Somerset. And um, we found this polar bear asleep. We were able to get close. I got very close relatively, but again, with understanding that the polar bear strength, number one is smell, sense of smell. So if the wind blow away from the polar bear toward me, the chances that he will wake up because of my presence is limited compared to if the wind was blowing away from me toward the polar bear. It is also a question how much uh, perfume, how much deodorant, shampoo, and all the rest of those things we use. So this is another, but mostly the, the wind direction. And I was able to get very close, almost as close. Come on. Uh-oh. As close as this one. And I'm here with um, that um, 80, at the time I was shooting with the Nikon, 80 to 200 millimeter lens. I was able to fill up the frame with that as close as I was to it. But the preparation was as such 
that I asked the Inuit guy, or since I've been in the um, in Arctic before, I bought with me uh, whatever they call it in English, I forgot, is a piece of tool that you hold by your hand and have a three balls on top of it on a, on a pin and it turn around and you see the direction of the wind. So I gave one to the Inuit guide and, I, and he was measured um, or give me all the time the direction of the wind. If the wind change and fly from the polar bear toward me, we had to evacuate. That's why I, take the, I took this trip only with two or three people. Only one person at a time come with me close to the polar bear. <clears throat> and if the wind change, we step back. We got that close. And then after we took about 10, 20 pictures and eventually the polar bear opened its eyes. And next time he stood up as the wind start changing, we start stepping back and um, the Inuit guide turned his snowmobile up create enough noise for the polar bear just to stand still, give us a chance to evacuate peacefully. So after the time that we did, I did a trip in the high Arctic in Canada, we, I also went to Svalbard where I learned that I can, or it's possible, and I run every trip every year, only two trips with two or three people the most, we go on snowmobile and looking for polar bear as they are traversing the ice, and they are looking for food. Uh, why in April? Because polar bear give birth around January, February. After four months or five months, she, she is in the den. She did not eat, of course, all this time. And when she got when she get out from the den, um, she's very hungry, but not just that, she also needs to feed or to nurse her young one. And they are very hungry. So there is <clears throat> this dynamic of Hungary and the best food for the polar bear during this time is hunting on um, ringed seals. Ringed seals are making hole in the ice during the winter time and they come up to breathe, but also to keep their young one in the hole. Ringed seal young one does not go swimming on the first seven to 10 days. So they will stay in the hole the polar bear will go over the ice and traverse, as you see, continue feeding. And the mother um, asking the young one to be quiet because she needs all the concentration she can to find the ringed seal. And she will go over the ice and smell from hole to hole. She will not touch any of the empty hole until she find a hole that she think that something is there and she smell the young one, the one that could not swim, that stay in a hole. They all will be deep as far as the ice, a meter, a meter and a half. And she will wait there. And we waited for her. In this case, I was sitting on the, on the ice with my butt with two other clients for over three hours till eventually here they are, we're sitting on the ice and waiting till she stood up and the power of her front legs, she broke the ice totally in, half a body in, you see the young one looking, learning how to do it and eventually coming out with the prey in her hand. Look at this pose of the polar bear and the power she lifting now, 150 to 200 pound ringed seal full of blubber. It is just stunning. Well, since I'm a diver, I could not just confine to see polar bear on the surface. I had a lot of encounters with polar bears, as you've seen, and some of the epic. I was earn, eager to be diving with them. So I set up an operation in 97, 98 to dive with polar bear, of course, nobody wants to come with me. I went out there and I found two or three people on the road that were willing to participate at least to, to test it. We hire a local guide, a local Inuit, and he took us to the water and we we're looking for polar bear after the second or third days. We saw one and we went, decided to go diving. And nobody of the three people that were with me wanted to be first with me, so they all throw luck. And one of them, this eventually got 
the key number to join me and then we went to the water. I went first, camera, 35 pound on my waist, dry suit, tank on my back and ready to uh, jump to the water or glide to the water from the boat. And I gave the other guy behind me another few, uh, a minute or so to get himself together to slide in. And I'm in the front of the polar bear. But I noticed something strange. I don't hear any noise. I look back and the guy could not swim toward me. He was still attached to the boat because the tank start, uh, got loose over his BCD. So they had to bring him up to the surface. Now I'm alone with a polar bear. I had to make a decision <laughs> what to do. Do I swim back or do I dive before the polar bear catch me? So some of you already know the answer. And to all of you, I went diving and the polar bear after me. Make, I did not go diving without doing research first. And I found out that before me, there were three or four people that dive with polar bear. Um, all of them took pictures. They were video, videographer and movie maker mostly. And all of them, all these four took mostly picture of only one polar bear. And their story was that the polar bear, uh, the average dive the polar bear will make is about 20 to 30 feet, 10 meter. Physiologically, physiology, it is also the case because of the way the, the blubber and the, the how, how much blubber the or fat the polar bear have and the, uh, and the fur that hold water cannot, it need to be extraordinary power to break down more than one atmosphere. So uh, going with this knowledge, I knew that if I dive to 40, 50 feet, I'll be safe, right? Makes sense. Uh, but I also know from already my experience in the wilderness being with the wild animal, that not all what we reported at the time till I did, it was holding well in mother nature. So I had to give myself another margin of safety because it could be a surprise. And it was a surprise, the polar bear, I polar bear stopped running after me. I was at 80 feet, he was about 75. By then the polar bear stopped. He become horizontal over the water, not vertical diving, but horizontal, flopping his leg. I can see the picture right now in the front of my eyes and slowly, slowly start to rise toward the surface. My heart was pumping 180 beats per minute. <laughs> I over, I over breathed the regulator. I was so fast. I almost got out of air. And I start looking another minute or two, where is the polar bear? Three minutes, but I could not hold anymore. And slowly I start surfacing and take zip of air and start breathing out of my BCD if any air left into it at 80 feet. Till eventually I break to the surface and nobody was there. Nobody. The boat gone. They were looking. They were looking for me, of course. But about half an hour to forty-five minutes. By then, I was freezing. But eventually, they found me, and that was the end. And everybody was happy. I'm alive, and I got back home. And I decide I want to do it again. I could not wait to do it again. It took almost seven, eight, 60, when I was 65, it was seven, eight years later. Um, in between, I had a chance to mentor a young Israeli that want to be a photographer. And by the time he finished two years with me, I told him that if he was in his early thirties, so I told him if I was in his age at the time, um, I will not stay still photography, I'll go into video and movie. Jonathan near his name. And he went, took a course in filmmaking in Israel and become a filmmaker. And the first movie he wanted to make was about me diving with the polar bear, he heard the story. But of course the cost and the technicality and the logistic was enormous. He could not do it. And we continue working on it. And about in the 2015, eventually he was able to raise um, it took about a million dollars to make the movie from production in the field until post-production at home and music and the editing. 
and he was able to raise the funding and together we went with a team that I created. Uh, Yoni brought his co-producer, Danny Menkin, and um, I brought with me Adam Ravitch, another uh, young man that I mentor earlier in his career, one today is Amy Award winning filmmaker, is extraordinary filmmaker underwater. And together we had a team, we worked before in the high Arctic in Canada and in uh, Svalbard. So he was naturally the first person to go and Inuit family of four people uh, heading by Joe Kalujak. And we went to do the story diving with the polar bear. The first picture you see here is a picture I took of Adam. As you see, Adam with a movie camera as feeling the family of not one and not two, but three polar bear mother and two cubs, something that never happened before. And I was lucky. And there's the picture that Adam took off from behind me, taking the picture with a still camera of the same family. And this is the picture I've taken, or some of the picture I've taken while Adam was doing the filming. I did the photography of stills and the family, mother and two cubs. One of the cubs was diving toward me and of course did not touch me. This is one of the picture I love the most because as you see here, the mother polar bear had, all, I, I had two encounter in, during the five days that we were there. And in this encounter, the mother polar bear was only with single one. It was already a juvenile. It was not a young one. It was about a year or year and a half old. But as you see here, very interesting. She did not move the young one to the opposite side of her fear of me because I stayed in the water and, the and I did not move to her there. I let them swim toward me all the time. She did not change direction. She just came in about maybe 10, 15 feet away, which I couldn't take the picture. The lens I used 1635 and I'm on a 35 millimeter here. And she hold the young one with one side and just keep swimming. But also interesting in this polar bear picture for a general idea is polar bear only swim with the front, um, the front pose the rear pose or the rear leg are only are uh, uh, directional, are the, the rotor like we have on a boat, only the rotor or the directional for the, for the polar bear. But so that's why she could hold the young one with one leg and still moving with the front one. That's how powerful they are. The second action, the excellent second encounter, the one that the, how do you call it? The epic one, if you want to call it, is when the, mother, the family of three clearly passed over my head, literally 90 degree over my head. I'm here at about 10 feet, looking up, 1635. My lens was at 18 millimeter here and getting the picture against the sun. And we move out before we go to Antarctica. Um, if any, anyone have a picture about the polar bear? It's amazing. So you, as man. you're saying, you would like go down to like 75, 80 feet to like make sure that you got away from them. Like, how did you get like the confidence or like understanding that you could be at 10 or 15 feet and still be okay? Like, how did you start to understand their behavior? I'm guessing. All right, very good question. And I'm glad you, you mentioned it. Um, one, Again, like with the great white, is the timing, the understand the timing and the behavior of the animal. So the timing to do the second trip was in August, at the time when the snow start melting, ice melting, less amount of glacier, the polar bear will need. It is was in Canada in the Hudson in the Hudson Bay, the polar bear will need to move from one place to the next to find food between the islands. So there is open water. So I did not know if I'm going to see mother and two cubs. Mother and one cub was fine. And so we saw, we go every day and look for the polar bear in this particular part of the Hudson. And some days we did not see any. And this was the last day of the trip. It was present from, well, I don't call it luck because luck is a preparation meet opportunity. You have to be in it to win it. So we st we went out there and we saw the family moving from one island 
and moving from the going from the water into one island, they crossed the island, we had a drawn up in the air, and then crossed to the other island, and then from there into a cliff where there are birds and the bear and the, the the eggs, and that's what the bear are looking for at this time of the year, because there's no more ice, there's no more holes of seals. So then they are looking for the, the birds that are on a cliff and they're looking for the eggs of those um, birds. So we knew more or less the territory. When we saw her coming down from one island, going to cross to the other, Adam and I went to the water about 200 feet away from her and the two cubs. We stayed on the surface. Adam and I were actually trading water. The boat left. They went another 100, 200 yards away from us. They could see us only in a binocular. We stayed in the water and we waiting for them. We could not swim to where them. We could not anticipate where they will go. But we can do, we stay on the surface, we were their target. And if she won't, she'll come toward us. And if she and she will not let the young one alone going after us. That was my observation before seeing polar bear on the surface with cubs. And that's exactly what happened. She swam directly at us, directly. She did not change. She could go 359 degree. One degree <laughs> will be 15, 20 feet. I could not take the picture. The visibility was not so good. She came directly over our head. When she came to about maybe 20 feet or seven, seven meter, Adam and I gave a sign to each other. We said, let's go together, deflate your RBCs. We had perfect buoyancy control. We stayed about 15 feet. Adam started rolling the camera. I raised my camera up and I was looking at them as they're coming toward me. And that's how we got it. We did not move. If we are stay in one place, let the animal move toward you is a peaceful interaction, just like with the great white is unthreatening behavior. But photographer that spend money and time and equip on equipment, not so much on trip anymore, they spend money mostly on equipment and go out, they rush, rush, rush to take the picture, to come on to tell the story. The idea of wildlife photographer is passion and passion. That's my view of it. That's my investment was, that's why I guess I'm here today with you. Wow, that is just incredible. Yep, agreed. But I have a question say again, about the, the first bear, the ones yes. you got close to on land. Did they the smell like dirty gym socks? <laughs> I did not have a chance to, to smell them, sweetheart. <laughs> I was so, so focused on the camera, so focused on my survival that I was not, <laughs> no, <laughs> no time to smell anything. Okay, thanks. All right, the next subject and will be the last animal that we're going to share with you today is the encounter in Antarctica um, in particular, uh, the king of Antarctica, which is the leopard seals. They will be mostly traveling and around the um, iceberg and around colony of um, penguin. When we see them around the, around the iceberg, they are be very playful. They are very curious. They are long. They are almost 12 to 15 long, feet long. They are heavy. They are extremely agile. They are fast. They are animated like nothing else you've seen before. This is a picture taken by one of, by one of my clients on a trip, um, as you see me here with a dry suit, um, dry suit by DUI, a uh, Zegel, uh, BCD, with a um, heater system by DUI, if you see the heater system on the back of the tank, and of course, uh, the Seacam camera and two strobes to take as good picture as possible. This picture of, um, of Jeff, that the, the, the leopard seal was playing with him. They will play, and their play seems to be aggressive to in the normal eyes of people, but the experienced eyes like myself, in this case, I've been 
uh, 17, 18 time in Antarctica and diving with them, they, they will play, they will make faces with their jaws because these are the only tools they have to intimidate us, but they will do nothing. However, I must say, and probably people heard the story, so I must relate to the story of one injury, one death in over 15 years of diving in Antarctica. There was only one accident but the record of the accident is the most important to know. So you realize what it happened. It's not a diving accident like you see here. It was a, re a British researcher from the British um, um, station. They went, the team went earlier today in the day, they looked for a leopard seal, they recorded. On the way back, one of them decided that she want to stay more and to realize, to see how, the, how the, this large female behave or acting. They told her not to. And she begged to stay, and eventually she left them. They left her there alone, very close to them, to the station. Hold and behold, after a short period of time, something had happened, and the leopard seal bit the fin of this researcher. So now you have 60, 80, maybe a hundred pound weight locked up in the mouth of the leopard seal that actually when you catch a, doll, a penguin is not more than 10 or 15 pounds. So both of them are in panic. The leopard seal don't know what to do because it's so heavy, he cannot release his canine teeth, got actually locked up on a fin and she could not pull off the, the leopard seal out to the surface and to survive. He took her down, she drowned and eventually she floated to the surface because eventually the leopard seal apparently was able to release his teeth out of them, out of the fin, and she passed away. And then the story goes, and the fear of leopard seal. I was in the water before, already two or three years before that, and one of the trick we told, I told the, the guys that seeing the polar, how the leopard seal behave, the leopard seal usually goes after the legs of the penguin. And that's what happened here, the same thing. So I tell guys, if you see the leopard seals coming toward the fin, you have to face it and kick in the front of it and move back, swim back toward to be in a group together or toward the reef or toward the rocks. So you'll be safe, so there's no reason. And the, polar, the leopard seal have no, no way to, to tackle you. And if you come after the head or after the shoulder, just come together and be like a group. And that's what happened. And all the trip that I've run were safe and nobody have been in, in any accident whatsoever. But the story goes on and the fear come out, oh, the leopard seal kill people. The circumstances are such that we need to know. What else we need to know? We need to know that the leopard seal is a solitaire and also a territorial. So that means there is no other leopard seal in the same area where, the, where one is, where this is, the, this is the area where we feed on the penguin. When we come in, something happened, there is an interaction. You don't, like we talked before, we don't go fight against a wild animal because they are stronger than us. They're faster, they're more dynamic. They can surprise us in no time. A great white, a polar bear and leopard seal. If you run away, they will run after us. But if we stay still in one place and vertical, they will be confused because they've never seen anything like it. It's not something they know how to deal with. In this case in particular, something even more interesting happened because when the leopard seal look at the glass of the camera, what does he see? It see actually itself. For it is another leopard seal. So what you try to do, it try to threaten or to chase away the subject that you see in the front of him. So he opened the mouth big in the front of the camera. I told the photographer, stay, don't move. The leopard seal leave and play and show his big mouth. And how do they feed? So this is a gentle penguin and they will swim at them and they catch them by the fin, as you see here, and drown them. But the leopard seal is playful and they will hold and let go 
and the, the penguin ran away, and the leopard still ran away, ran after them all the way to the ice, pick up the same one that he held just a few minutes earlier and bring it back to the water. And eventually after two or three times, the penguin is breathless, is actually drowned. And that's the picture that you've seen by now many times and won several um, competitions of the um, facing reality by the penguin. Now, most photographers at this time leave, but I decide to stay to bring you, I'm sorry? I decide to stay and to bring closer and to de-cheap or to de reveal the process of how a leopard seal really feed on animal that have so much feathers because there is nothing in the feather to eat and it's stuck in your thought like not tomorrow. So how the leopard seal remove the feathers? First of all, he catch the penguin by the, by the leg, as I mentioned, and with the canine teeth, he scratch the skin, then he shake it loudly, left and right, as you see here shaking, one more and one more out of the water. Then the skin peel off, and that's what left. and only then it can eat. And after this, it can play with us in the front of the camera. That's amazing. Thank you. That is the animal that the king of Antarctica. If we have the king of the ice in the high Arctic and we have this in Antarctica. By the way, it's a good chance to ask question. Anybody knows why it called Antarctica? Because it's opposite the Arctic. Yeah, and where does it come from? Not sure. It came from the Greek name Arctic. Mm. And then Antarctic, and later on we change it Arctic and Antarctica. All right, guys, we're coming to an end. And all the pictures that you see here <clears throat> are taken in their natural setting and all animals depicted here are free and wild. If I leave anything to with you, be kind and be mindful of our ocean. It needs all the attention and all the preservation and protection we can provide it. And today, as you already heard the news, United States government passed uh, uh, the bill of $500 billion or, or less, between 400 to 500 billion to, to do something about global warming. Um, but I must say here, from my point of view, the train left the station. Global warming is staying with us. We cannot put the finger in any iceberg and stop the melting of the ice. It is already started. Ice is melting in quantity that is hard to believe we may be able to slow it down, but we cannot reverse the course. So all the Tesla we buy and all the, the solar energy we use and hydro and wind <laughs> will help only in slowing and, and demand us to find ways how to adapt to this new environment and how the wilderness, the trees, the, the bees and the and the butterfly and the birds will adapt to this new reality. If you want to see more of my work or to join the expedition, biganimal.com, or if you want to uh, contact me directly, I'm also at biganimal.com. Any question about photography, about trips, about where to go, when to go, why to go, I'll be happy to answer and to share with you. I'm hoping That's for a few questions if you like. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing all your stories. I thank you too, guys. And having everybody stay with us, 24 people, wonderful. Yeah. Hey, almost. will your book be available on Amazon or how can we get your book? The book available on Amazon, yes. Okay. It's 50, I think it's 58 bucks now. 
And uh, if you buy directly from Amazon, if you buy from me, it will be different because I um, contribute about 30% of the value of the book to Mission Blue and Sylvia Earle operation. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So I sell the book for $180. And um, if people be to tomorrow at uh, Pacific Grove at uh, Jason Bradley um, Gallery, you'll be able to have your book for sale there. Great. Will you be doing the same presentation tomorrow at Jason's or it would be a little different? It will be a little bit different. I'll be talking mostly about my um, pivotal images in my career. The, the images that create my, my credit or my, <laughs> uh, my history. So it will be also images of other animal and also topside animal. Um, like the leopard seal, the, uh, not the leopard seal, the snow leopard, jaguar, tigers, and uh, leopard. Amos, did Jason print some of your uh, prints and yes. will they be hanging? Awesome. Yes. Yeah. All right. Look forward to seeing that tomorrow night. Awesome. Bravo. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm in Alaska, so I forgot about the time change and I missed it. Um, will it be on Zoom tomorrow? Um, no, they will not be on Zoom tomorrow. It'll be just on the gallery. But did you know, record this, Mackenzie? Yep, we did record this. Uh, oh, so very we'll, good. Yep. So it'll we'll probably be on our website. Yep, for eventually we'll get only. it up there. Yeah, for members only. If you can send me a copy, please, uh, Olga, uh, Helga. Yeah, we can certainly get you a copy of it. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Where are you going next, Amos? <laughs> I'm going next on Wednesday, going to the Galapagos uh, with only eight people. Wonderful team on a 154, 154 foot yacht. And after this, in um, October, November, to Timor Leste, somewhere in the South Pacific between Indonesia and Australia, to be with multiple cetacean, but mainly uh, pygmy blue whale, sperm whale, pilot whale, and then to Baja California, to um, on the west side, on the Pacific side, with um, with the marlin. Uh, the striped marlin hunt for the, the sardine, and then to Dominica. Yeah. Okay. That is only till December. And then next year, open for the public to, for you to, to view, to look, and to see something maybe interesting to you. Great. And is your documentary still circu circulating in, in festivals? And uh, uh, it, was, it was beautiful. I'm just curious how you're getting picked up and any uh, nominations in the Oscar documentary uh, fleet coming your way? Um, the, the, doc, the movie did is on, it on turn around among, among um, documentary festival. It won several awards for cinematography and for, not for acting, but mostly cinematography <laughs> <laughs> and location. Um, it does not do anymore. The, the producer, it is in their hand. They put all the effort and the money. So they're not doing anything very much with it, they're just private or public uh, presentation um, whenever they have time or they do their own. And it is available for rental rent. It's $10 for three days. And, um, and the password is a b um, picture of his life, one word, um, that picture of life dot com. And uh, it's ten dollars for three days, and twenty dollars you can have the movie, store it for your, for your, for your own purpose of presentation, or sharing with school or any group of people. Oh, that's awesome! Did you did you submit to Sundance? Just curious like, if you've tried that process. I I don't know. I don't do the submission. I don't have the right to do the submission. I did not ask for it. Okay. Uh, the producer, if you know how to. Mm -hmm. I will send it to them and have them do it. I 
I direct them to do certain things, but I don't know how to um, how to get to Sundance. Okay, yeah. Well, this yeah. is produced by Steven Spielberg's what, uh, sister, right? Is that correct? I'm sorry? This is Steven Spielberg's sister who, who, who's the producer? Yes, Nancy Spielberg is the producer. <clears throat> uh, co um, she's co-producer, yeah. yeah. Well, next time I see Steven, I'm gonna give him a poke. No. <laughs> <laughs> I bumped into him in the elevator once at work and, and teased him. So he was riding up and down. He missed his floor. <laughs> well, I, loved, I loved it, Ramos. It, it was it was just really lovely. So excellent, Doc. Thank you very much. Oh, nobody see me because there's no light in my room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now you can there see. You go. There you go. Oh. Hey. Well, we if, can uh, see you okay during your presentation. I, it just you in black afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any, any final mm -hmm. questions for Amos? It's always good to see you, Amos. Good to see you too, guys. And thank, thank you for you. your time on, on Friday night. Thank you, Amos. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Certainly appreciate it.